see the screen. So, yeah. for our next talk, we have uh, a talk about the progress and developments in open source electric propulsion for nanosats and picosats uh, at the Applied Ion Systems. And with us, we have Michael Bretti, who is the founder of the Applied Ion Systems. And Michael is an interdisciplinary engineer with an intense dedication to and passion for the fields of electric space propulsion plasma physics, high vacuum engineering, pulse power, and particle beam systems. So uh, with a um, huge experience and um, innovating at the edge um, of those technologies, specifically for their miniaturization um, of them. So Michael, we're super glad to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, like I said, if any of the videos aren't playing, just let me know because um, I can't see on my end. Um, and thank you for that introduction. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Michael Bray, founder of Applied Ion Systems, and I'll be sharing uh, the progress and developments of open source electric propulsion uh, at AIS. Um, so as a really brief background, for those of you who haven't heard of um, this, this uh, project or this work, um, currently, as far as I'm aware, AIS is really the only independent maker-based at-home R&D company um, developing advanced plasma ion thrusters. Uh, where I'm focusing on ultra low cost, um, very easy to manufacture and open source thrusters for CubeSats and pocket cubes, um, as well as providing resources for hobbyists, um, enthusiasts in the nanosat communities. Uh, so you can see in the picture, that's actually uh, my current setup with a vacuum chamber for testing the thrusters. Uh, it's very, very small, actually. It's only big enough um, just to fit pocket cube class thrusters in. I and mean, actually, you can kind of see a little bit in the viewport, I have one of the hall thrusters I've been developing recently in there, which I'll get to later in my slides. So very first, to kick things off, um, at the beginning of this year, I collaborated with Care Weather Technologies um, to provide one of my original GPPT-3 thrusters. Um, these were the same ones that were integrated aboard the AMSAT Spain Genesis um, pocket cubes. Um, so you can see on the left, there's a picture of the uh, CubeSat. And then on the right, um, the thruster sticking out of the back of the CubeSat uh, with inside the deployer. And as of March of this year, uh, this uh, satellite was successfully deployed into orbit um, from um, Rocket Labs in New Zealand. Um, so these are a couple of screenshots from the live stream that day. Um, so as far as I'm aware, this is actually the first open source electric propulsion system to make it to orbit. Uh, and this is also my first system to make it to orbit as well. So very exciting um, for this effort and a kind of a big advance for, for um, I think, a lot of open source uh, initiative moving forward on such advanced technologies now bringing it down to um, actually getting to orbit. So this thruster, um, I presented on at the, at the first open source CubeSat workshop I, I did back in 2019. Um, and all the plans and everything are up and available on the AIS website, uh, which you can check out and download. Uh, the thruster hasn't been tested yet, but um, it's still up there 550 kilometers and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get some results at some point. Uh, so moving forward, um, I've been working significantly on uh, ionic liquid ion source electrospray thrusters. So this particular type of thruster is an electrospray ion thruster that uses a room temperature molten salt, in this case, EMI BF4. Um, very small size, 42 by 42 by 16 millimeters. So this is a pocket cube class thruster. Uh, right here, you can see the most recent iteration. And this thruster has gone through a number of iterations um, over maybe the year and a half that I've been developing this system. Um, and as of the most recent ignition test, was a few, which was a few months ago this year, uh, the system achieved about almost six micronewtons of thrust at about 4,200 seconds ISP, um, at a little bit less than one watt power. So for this system, if you've been following uh, my efforts recently, um, I hand modified the original ridge um, emitter, which was uh, machined into porous glass. Um, into a single spike. So this was really the first time that I implemented a single spike emitter for, for testing moving forward. Um, here you can see a video of thruster operation in the vacuum system. Um, so hopefully the video is playing now. Um, but you can see the ion beam coming out of the thruster and then there's a pause and a transition. So one of the really cool things about ionic liquid ion source is unlike conventional ion thrusters, you don't need a neutralizer because 
of the way the fuel, fuel is composed, you can extract both positive and negative ion beams. So you can achieve charge neutralization by flipping polarities of the thruster. So you can see here the thruster is operating at several cycles um, between the positive and the negative ion beams uh, as it's operating in vacuum. So unfortunately, this um, project has been a little bit paused because the next step to moving forward would be getting a 2 day D array of about 100 spikes or so manufactured for a full thruster system, uh, which has been out of my capabilities currently. However, uh, the system is ready to go for testing whenever I move on to that next phase. So moving forward, this year's big developments have been in advanced molecular fuels, uh, specifically from um, low power micro hall thrusters. So the fuel that I've been exploring is adamantane, which even in the electric propulsion field is pretty much unknown. Um, it's a very unique substance. It's a solid, looks exactly like coarse table salt um, that has a lot of so interesting properties that are similar to iodine, which has been heavily explored in electric propulsion as an alternative fuel. So it has a high molecular weight, high ionization cross-section, a very low sublimation temperature in vacuum. So this means it can be stored as a solid and then you heat it with low power and can sublimate directly into a gas to be fed into the thruster. Unlike iodine, however, it's very safe, it's non-toxic and non-corrosive, and this allows for un solid unpressurized fuel storage and fuel feed for uh, thruster systems, eliminating uh, pressurization and, and complex valving. There are key challenges, however. Uh, it's a very complex plasma ion species that evolve. Uh, it's a hydrocarbon plasma, which runs a bit dirty um, with some deposits in the thruster, and there are large uh, beam losses and ion, ionization inefficiencies evolve, involved with this particular fuel. So my first preliminary work has been just testing and uh, the sublimation and ionization properties of the adamantane with a very simple discharge cell. Um, so you can see a picture of it on the right. Um, so I achieved sublimation at less than three watts um, at less than 15 degrees C um, sublimation temperatures, very low ionization power levels of one to two watts to get a plasma. And then multiple topologies were demonstrated, everything from a basic glow discharge to ion beam extraction to neutralizer plume extraction and negative charge extraction. So here you can actually see a video of one of the topologies run to simulate a hollow cathode. Um, so you, here you can actually see the plasma formation and that's a plasma plume extraction um, which is used again to simulate kind of a hollow cathode mode of operation, uh, which would be used later for hall thruster testing. So this again is being run on adamantane fuel. Um, it starts as a solid and I heat it up, sublimated into the um, little discharge chamber um, and then apply the high voltage for the discharge. So moving forward from this, I developed um, a micro glow discharge hollow cathode neutralizer, the GDN1. Uh, this is a very, very compact, uh, very low power hollow cathode. So unlike traditional hollow cathodes, which require special material inserts like lanthanum hexaboride, um, this is made purely with uh, stainless steel components and a 3D printed housing using Somos Perform, which is a ceramic embedded SLA, um, which is quite um, readily available and relatively low cost to get done through third party manufacturers like Zometry. Um, and this also runs at a very high voltage mode as opposed to normal um, hollow cathodes to eliminate um, these special inserts. So this can be run with any gas. However, specifically I developed this to run with adamantane for my micro hall thruster developments. Um, so you can see here actually the electrolyte plume being emitted as it's being run in its um, self-discharge mode. So it's mounted on a hall thruster now, but the hall thruster is not operating. Um, this is just testing the uh, hollow cathode operation prior to ignition with the hall thruster. Um, so this was a pretty exciting development. And it was also really the first time that I was able to qualify Somos Perform for a more harsh environment of um, of uh, vacuum and plasma bombardments and all those things. So moving forward, this was the first hall thruster of this development, the EHT mi one micro end hall thruster. So it's about a third of a U in size, uh, very small fuel capacity, three grams. What you see here is the fuel tank, the heater, the hall thruster head, the hollow cathode, and the drive electronics all compact together in a, a little, nice little package. Uh, the total power is about 25 watts. 
uh, with an expected thrust of three, 30 to 100 micronewtons. Um, this one didn't have a valve involved, so it's just a direct sublimation. So it's more of a prototype system um, to be used for, for testing and development, these, developing these types of technologies. So the first preliminary test was actually run with a tungsten filament neutralizer to provide electrons, since this is much easier to get running than a uh, hollow cathode. So just heating up a tungsten filament, uh, which ionizes the gas. Um, so with this test, I was able to actually achieve beam, uh, a couple hundred micro amps of beam. Um, so I did achieve successful ignition with uh, the filament first, then moving on, we can see here the full system test with the hollow cathode and the hall thruster running both on adamantane uh, fuel. So you can actually see the plume formation and those spark discharges are actually discharges from the Faraday cup. Uh, the beam current was overwhelming my instrumentation. So it was kind of breaking down in vacuum because it couldn't bleed off the charge enough in time. Uh, but this was also, uh, this was the first time I demonstrated the full hall thruster um, ignition with adamantane with both the hollow cathode and the hall thruster itself. I believe these these first tests were also the first time reported in the field that um, a hall thruster has been operated on adamantane. It's been used a, a few times with high power gridded ion thrusters, but I don't believe I've actually seen it um, run with hall thrusters prior. So moving forward, this is the most recent uh, developments that I've been working on. This is taking all that, um, all the knowledge gained from the EHT1 and shrinking it down further. So this is the EHT1 PQ Pico Anno layer Hall thruster. So now this takes uh, Hall thruster technology down to pocket cube class size. So we're looking at about an eighth of a U or one P in size. Um, 18 grams. Uh, fuel capacity, about 10 watts of power at expected 20 to 50 micronewtons of thrust. So what you see here is everything. This is actually the hall thruster head. Um, there is an integrated micro valve inside the fuel tank. There's the fuel tank with sublimation heater and presser plate to compress the um, adamantane fuel. And the um, thruster head bolts directly onto the top of the fuel tank, uh, which the fuel just goes directly into the tank. So there's no external lines or anything like that. Um, for the system. So very, very small thruster. I believe this is probably the smallest full hall thruster system that's ever been designed. Um, so the electronics will sit both on the top and the bottom um, to bring the, the size out a little bit more. But And I'm working on a new version that's going to be experimenting with a carbon nanotube neutralizer um, that I haven't uh, flushed out all the details yet, but that's also in the works. So here you can kind of see a couple of shots of the thruster. So on the left is the fuel tank, which has, again, the heater at the bottom. There's a fuel valve on one side and then the storage inside the tank itself. And this directs fully, directly bolts to the thruster head uh, to provide gas um, directly into the hall thruster. So it's a very, very compact and tightly integrated system. Again, no pressurization, so it eliminates any pressurization um, issues regarding um, launch, especially for secondary payloads, um, and also kind of simplifies the system as well. Um, so here's another shot of the thruster. So you can see a little bit of the anode and the pole pieces with a prototype board on it for testing. And then on the right side, you can actually see a plume from it from one of the recent tests uh, in a neutralizerless mode. So here is actually a video of the thruster operating in a neutralizerless mode. Um, while this is plasma, this is not actually ignition. Um, I did not read beam from this. Um, so there is plasma formation, but there is not beam. So it's not quite there yet. Um, for this test. However, this was the first time I was able to achieve a stable anode layer plasma formation um, operating this thruster. Um, so after this test, I switched to a neutralizer test. So again, going back to the tungsten filament neutralizer. So in this test, uh, although you can't see the plume because the uh, neutralizer is so bright, I was able to read much higher currents with this system. So 
uh, about two milliamps of current, which translates with this fuel to about 30 to 40 micronewtons of thrust. Um, so this was uh, the first time that I successfully generated beam with the system. Uh, the tungsten filament neutralizer is not the final solution moving forward because that takes about 50 watts of power to run. Um, so this will be replaced with the new uh, carbon nanotube neutralizer that I'm working on. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get the details finalized in time for this presentation, but that should be um, hopefully coming up within the next couple of weeks um, that I'll be sharing those details with um, publicly over the various AIS channels. Finally, recent development that I've been working on is a new vacuum arc thruster. It's the VAT1 um, PQ micro vacuum arc thruster. So again, made for pocket cube class systems, though it can be easily compatible um, with small cube sets. So very low mass, very small size. The fuel is any solid metal, um, though typically titanium and aluminum are the most common in what I'm currently experimenting with. So about 2.5 watts of power at one to 10 micronewtons of thrust. So on the right, you kind of see the current iteration. Um, it's a bit messy because it's still in the prototyping phase. However, uh, it is moving forward. And actually, just last night, I ran this test. Uh, this was the first time that I achieved ignition with the onboard supplies, because uh, prior tests were running with uh, external power supplies. So here you can actually see the thruster firing at a little bit less than 2 hertz. Um, so this is actually running titanium fuel. So there's a solid titanium bar in there that's um, being ablated away by the trigger pulse. Um, so moving forward, there's going to be a lot of tests coming up in the upcoming uh, next couple of weeks to get this thing um, working um, working more, more efficiently and getting it up to speed. And then finally, to close things out, um, this test was one of the earlier tests I did with uh, much more power um, with the bench top supply, so kind of pushing the system to see how far it can go. Um, as a precaution, uh, there's, there is a lot of strobing and flashing, so if anyone has any issues with strobing, um, just look away because this can be kind of intense. Um, so I will be starting it in a couple of seconds. Um, so here we can see the thruster firing at much higher power levels. So this would be um, kind of the mode of operation if a larger power supply was wanted um, with a little bit more space for, let's say, a CubeSat class system. Um, so this is running at 10 hertz, um, which is actually still kind of for a vacuum arc thruster, um, but really pushing the system hard. Um, again, it also utilizes and leverages the Somos Perform housing uh, for the bottom part that holds the titanium fuel, and then there's a special machine copper anode on the top. Um, so that, that kind of wraps up all the developments that have been done recently for applied ion systems, and um, some of the systems have already been released um, under the CERN uh, Open Hardware License V2. Um, so you can actually download the files like the Illus one, the um, Pulse Plasma Thruster. Uh, those ones have already been released, and hopefully this uh, by the end of this year I will be releasing um, design files for the neutralizer and for the um, first end hall thruster, and then moving on hopefully uh, once the um, anode layer thruster and the vacuum arc thruster are um, more up to speed, start getting those files out as well. Um, so you can follow all these efforts and everything uh, through various um, sources. Everything I do is completely open and pretty much done real time. So you can see the entire process from debugging to troubleshooting. Uh, I do live tests and every test is, is either live tweeted and I upload video and pictures immediately as it's happening or I do live streams. Um, and then break down the thrusters afterwards and, and um, go through every single part of the step. Um, every step of the entire process from the initial sketches all the way to um, end of life testing. Um, so with that, I want to thank you very much uh, for listening to this talk. And uh, if there's any questions, uh, uh, the floor is open. Thank you, Michael. Um, with so many updates, I feel like we have to schedule OSW twice a year to, to, to cover the progress of projects like yours. So th thank you for um, uh, guiding us through all the updates uh, and super exciting uh, things. So 
uh, there's a question from, from me <laughs> on the chat um, about the perceived uh, practical applications for this range of um, uh, of thrust. Um, I'm, I'm talking about um, you know the actual preserve. Would that be used for maneuvering or um, any any kind of orbit raising or um, or just altitude control, right? So, what are the perceived applications in, in terms of the, the impulse also? That, uh, the specific impulse that uh, you have. Yeah. So, so the biggest limitation I think for electric propulsion of this, um, primarily the performance is, is limited by um, power. So the more power you have, the more thrust and ISP you can achieve generally. Um, but also the size really limits the fuel capacity and also the efficiency and everything you can achieve. Um, so when you start talking about this power and size class, uh, what you're probably going to see mostly is use cases for primarily station keeping, so um, using little bursts of uh, thrust to, to maintain orbit or slow your decay. Um, you could do very small maneuvers with it, nothing huge, uh, not, you know, kilometers or anything, but you could do get, you know, a couple meters of movement here or there um, for, for collision avoidance and stuff. But primarily I'm envisioning this stuff to be used mostly for um, station keeping to keep stuff up longer, especially in low Earth orbit. Um, the big factor, again, is the total impulse. Um, just because these systems, because they're so small, um, the lifetimes are very limited either on the mechanisms or the fuel capacity. The thrust actually isn't too bad. Um, with uh, several micronewtons of thrust or a couple tens of micronewtons of thrust, you can actually do a lot in low Earth orbit. But um, in order to, to, to do more with that thrust, you have to have longer lifetimes. Um, so if you wanted to move to a system that could do much larger orbital raises and stuff, you'd have to pick a technology that would be, um, that has inherently longer lifetimes, like um, FEEP, for example, which is a liquid metal um, ion thruster. Um, I am starting to work on a little bit, but I, I haven't started flushing out the details yet. Is something that would be suitable for this class that could be expanded to more, um, more mission um, capabilities. But for these systems, the the small pulse thrusters, the small hall thruster, and everything that would be kind of limited to, again, just um, small stuff. Cool. Uh, thanks. And I can see there's another question from Red um, about the. Um, stability of the focus and dynamic lighting adaptation for the videos because the videos are awesome and they're super engaging also um to, to you know showcase your work uh, and i think that Red is asking on um, what could be done um to to further the engagement aspect of them um so yeah yeah those those videos i'm literally holding holding uh, my my phone in one hand and I'm operating the thruster in the other, um, so it's it's a, it's a bit of a janky setup. Um, but I do uh, definitely for engagement. I uh, when I when I can, I do try to do live streams um, so that ways people can actually interact and and ask questions and things as it's happening. And when I do live tweet and everything on Twitter, I upload the videos immediately after I take them. Um, so there is that engagement and the phone videos. Are definitely better than the webcam stuff. Um, for the live streams, the the video quality is really really bad. Um, so so I too tend to try to just upload things immediately as I'm going. But um, that's kind of one of the the big things about this effort is uh, these tests. Every single test is done live, and even when things go horribly wrong, when they most often do, um, you know, it's everyone is knowing exactly what's happening at all times. Cool. So uh, we are past our time for this talk, and uh, I would like to, to, to thank Michael once again uh, for the excellent update and answer the questions.